Good afternoon and welcome to Leveraging Risk Management as a cornerstone of your Connected Assets Security Strategy, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Medicaid. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Nice way to view the screen. Click on the top center, get it in side-by-side -side mode. Then you can adjust the divider to get the slides and the video boxes the size you like. And it should say speaker view in the top right-hand corner. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 35 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Todd Green, VP and Enterprise CISO with Atrium Health, Christopher Couchet, VP and CISO with Albany Medical Center, and Jonathan Langer, co-founder and CEO with Medigate. So lots to cover. Let's jump right in. Todd, why don't you start us off? Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Todd Green. I'm with Atrium Health. So we're a fairly large um, healthcare network based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. We've got about uh, 70,000 teammates and we serve a combined population of roughly 7.7 .7 million. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but we're probably one of the top uh, top five largest health systems um, that has an integrated medical school as well. Um, I, my little claim to fame, I guess, for me, my introduction um, I started with a cybersecurity program back when it was called Information Security in the year 2000, January. Um, been with the program as an engineer, worked my way up into management, and now I'm the enterprise CISO for our collective organization. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Very good, Todd. Thank you for that. Chris? Thanks, uh, Anthony. Uh, so I'm from Albany Medical Center. Uh, as, as stated, I'm the VP and CISO. Albany Med uh, is a five uh, hospital system up in, uh, in upstate New York. Uh, we're a little unique in that we're the only academic medical center in about a uh, two and a half to three hour radius, uh, you know, north to, north to Canada, south to, uh, south to New York City, east uh, to the middle of Massachusetts, and then west out to uh, Rochester and the Syracuse area. So we're, we're a little unique in this area. Um, otherwise, we're, you know, total about 1,600 bed uh, facilities. Uh, with an 820 bed uh, academic medical center and uh, one of the oldest uh, medical colleges in that in that uh, scope uh, as Albany Med. Very good, Chris. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Langer. I'm the CEO of uh, Medigate. Uh, we're a, a vendor in the healthcare space. Uh, we provide uh, healthcare systems with security. Uh, for all of their connected assets, IoT, medical devices, IT, and so on. And we also provide a clinical operational efficiency analytics around the uh, medical device inventory uh, to improve utilization rates. Uh, and that's our combined story. Looking forward to a good discussion today. All right, very good. Uh, let's start off with some, some getting a baseline on things. Chris, let's start with you. How do you define connected assets and do you see this definition having evolved and continuing to evolve over time? Sure. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at what we sit on from a, an academic medical center. And, you know, I think we have, uh, you know, we have the classic IT solutions, servers, laptops, desktops, printers, all the ancillary stuff. But we then have quite a, a large number of medical devices. Uh, quite frankly, it's two to one uh, from a medical device perspective, just to give you the, the the, the scope of what most hospitals have to deal with in terms of the, their connected devices. And then you look at our research uh, mission that we have as well. And then you start layering on top of all of the other IOMT and IOT uh, type devices, whether it's facilities, whether it's a, a, biomed a unique biomedical device, whether it's even a connected TV. Um, so connected assets has absolutely grown from when, uh, you know, we were still running uh, you know, IBM, uh, IBM 8000s uh, in, in, the, in the environment. So uh, definitely connected assets now means anything that touches our network, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, 802.11, whether it's uh, direct connected, whether it's, um, you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, whatever the, whatever the connectivity protocol is, uh, it, it means everything at this point. Uh, Jonathan? 
Sure. Uh, so first, I, I agree 100% with uh, with Chris's uh, answer. And I'd say that when I look at um, connected assets and healthcare systems, I think that one of the, the unique parts is A, the diversity of the devices and healthcare systems. So many manufacturers and types of devices and different roles and functionalities. Uh, and also the healthcare specificity uh, comes into play. When I categorize it, kind of similar to what Chris said, uh, definitely seeing medical devices, uh, and that is on the rise in terms of connectivity. Uh, one of the challenging things is that they're not always connected. So some devices jump back and forth onto the network uh, on and off. Uh, so that's that, that doesn't make life easier, uh, but that's something that we need to deal with, uh, obviously. Um, enterprise IoT, that's that's growing everywhere, not just in healthcare, but uh, the, the smart TVs, the smart locks, uh, the, uh, the, the cameras and, and, and whatnot. And the IT assets, uh, which many of them in healthcare do play a clinical workflow functionality. If it's EMR clients, if it's the uh, various hospital information systems and so on, uh, that's, uh, that's, what, that, that's the way that I like to look at it. From an, from an evolution perspective, one thing that I'm just observing uh, the industry, one of the things that I find interesting that I think is gonna happen more and more is that uh, we're going to see more devices outside of the, the four walls of the hospital. Uh, and I think COVID was somewhat an accelerant to this uh, with regard to uh, telehealth and uh, RPM, remote patient monitoring, and so on. Um, and perhaps that's going to be a security or inventory and then security challenge moving forward. But uh, that's the way that I like to categorize the world. Very good. Todd, your thoughts? Uh, I, I think Chris and Jonathan covered it very well. I, I would say my definition is very simplified. Um, it's really any device that you know can either connect to our network or really um, directly connect to the internet. You know, you got to keep in mind that um, if it's behind your four walls but it's not connected to your network, you could still be responsible for it. So I do think it kind of goes in both veins. Um, I do think it's going to continue to evolve. I think we can see that that's apparent. Um, COVID probably drove some adoption of new technologies very quickly within healthcare. But um, additionally, you know, it's really on the wireless front. Um, we're seeing less and less of hardwired uh, devices and the majority are wireless. You know, they can range, we've mentioned TVs, but you know, vending machines that are connected to the network. So could these also pose a threat or an entry point in some way? So connected devices really runs the gamut as far as I'm concerned. So Todd, just to follow up a little bit, so we have wireless, does that present different challenges? The fact that it's not wired and then what Jonathan had mentioned about devices that jump on and off, uh, are these specific challenges? Yeah, of course. So especially on the wireless front, you know, um, we like to joke in our area, we may be the largest uh, provider of wireless service in our uh, geographic region because we have so many facilities and we have a guest network. But, uh, you know, joking aside, um, wireless is quite ubiquitous now within any organization. So trying to figure out how to protect that presents its own challenges. I do think solutions like NAC are a very good option um, to, uh, so that way if somebody connects something that hasn't gone through the proper channels for review and adoption on our network, uh, that they're not given access to the actual internal resources of our network. So they'd be funneled back out directly to the internet, which is probably gonna generate a call, which then means we can cycle them back through our normal review process. Chris, anything you wanna to touch on with, with that wireless aspect? Yeah, no, I, we definitely see that. Uh, you know, we definitely see that in the different uh, biomedical modalities as well. They're starting to incorporate, you know, if you take a look at your fleet of infusion pumps, for example, uh, which tend to be your probably your your largest bolus of devices in a medical center setting. Uh, they're all they're all uh, running a, a Wi-Fi card, um, and and the challenge is, do they run a Wi-Fi card that's configurable? Do they run it with the right encryption standards? You know, all of those types of things. Uh, so we are. I totally agree with Todd. Uh, we're seeing that shift. Th there are devices that that still will, re will really require that bandwidth and, and be direct connect, but uh, Wi-Fi is definitely becoming a, you know, a much, a much more ubiquitous uh, technology in, in medical devices, at least. All right, very good. Todd, let's start with you on this question. What are some ways you work to ensure the security of connected assets? And why is this area of information security so challenging? Well, uh, you know, there are a host of things that we're trying to do to, you know, 
um, ensure the security of those devices. It really is trying to be at the seat of the table up front. Um, you know, in years past, uh, we weren't always brought to the table to have a discussion as people were selecting partners. I do think Infusion Pumps is a good example that Chris mentioned. Um, that's a project within our organization. We decided to standardize on one pump and it involved a purchase of thousands of devices. Um, they brought us to the table during product selection so that we could ask the questions we needed to ask as they were looking at multiple vendors. And then once we got down to the final two, if you will, um, they go through a, a vendor new onboarding process to identify any red flags. We also use third party services to identify, especially if, if it has cloud-based components, um, whether or not they may have some risks associated with their cloud functions. Um, and you know what we try to do is make sure everything's funneled through that same process. And then there's awareness of what we need to do once these systems come on board. Uh, we actually even took it another step further um, with the infusion pumps. We decided since we were buying so many of them and they could be a launching point to other areas that it may be a good idea to go ahead and pay an outside firm to pen test one of those devices. So we actually boxed up one of the brand new units, sent it off and had them you know, have their way with it, if you will. Um, and that was something to reassure us that what was communicated by our vendor during the onboarding and the vetting process uh, was accurate. Now we didn't do we don't do that with every single purchase, but something so large, uh, we felt it was warranted, um, and it also affirmed what the vendor had told us. So knowing that what um, was said in a sales call or by a sales engineer was backed up by an outside party meant a lot to us. So. Um, that's some examples of what we're trying to do to, main, to maintain and ensure the security of those devices as they come into our networks. Chris. Yeah, I think I, you know, I, I may have a little bit of an advantage here. I'm, I'm a bit of a mutt. Um, I, I'm actually a master's degree in biomedical engineer. Oh. Uh, and a, you know, and 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 I hold all my certifications in security. So I've, you know, I, I've had a I've had a kind of a split career, a mixed career. I I, I still have responsibility for all the biomedical equipment on top of all the security uh, things now for quite a while. Um, but but deep down, everything that Todd said is absolutely right on. What, what we decided when we decided to move forward with a biomedical security program was to try to have that program mimic as much as possible our IT program. Uh, and that starts right, right from the beginning uh, at, at acquisition. It's, you know, it's vetting the solution it's looking at contracting, it's looking at doing a formal risk assessment process, it's bringing that in and having a risk register before you even get these devices into your environment. Um, I, I love that idea of taking, you know, taking an infusion pump and getting it pen tested. Um, we also, uh, you know, Todd mentioned this idea of maybe some education and knowledge and, and you know, I've, what, what, if you've heard me talk before, what you, what you may have heard is this concept around this um, this area of medical devices really not talking like IT devices and having it having their own language, and why that's important is we we acknowledge that right up front and understand that our typical IT tool sets can't handle medical devices uh, in a way that we would need to, and and while we can do some investigation on these on these current tool sets. Um, and I know, and this isn't a plug for Medigate or anything else like that, uh, although I know Jonathan is on here. Um, you know, we do use technologies, we use IoT technologies that allow us a real-time view into these medical devices. And, and again, the difference here is that they talk a totally different language that our normal IT solutions just don't understand. You can't take a typical IDS, IPS, and pop a medical device on your network and expect that it's going to handle it. You need these tailored device. You need these tailored solutions that can really look and and understand that this is a medical device. It's this vendor. It's this model. It's running this version of firmware on it. It has this set of vulnerabilities uh, that have been you know that have been uh, uh, released for it, and it's just very very different. And then profile it to say okay. How does this thing supposed to look? So we, we've taken that approach that medical devices, while we want to apply the same processes, the same level of rigor that we've been doing for years in IT, we really want to put that you know, to, the, to the test with medical devices 
and understand that they are a little different and, and, and accommodate for those differences. Hey, Anthony, if I could jump in the back of what Chris has said there, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, additional steps you can take in addition to having something that can speak the language, you know, micro segmentation is something that can be very helpful. While it's not a fit for everything, um, it is a fit in certain scenarios. So, you know, if you have critical systems that, um, especially in healthcare, that provide a, a dedicated function and they're going to be quasi static, um, you know, we have elected to, in many instances, uh, to firewall and IPS those off um, and restrict them only to the access they need to get out of that network. That way, we know they're going to still uh, continue to be available. You know, um, should something else go wrong within the network, we can isolate that. Uh, additionally, one other thing that we like to do is look at these types of systems, these connected assets, and understand, do they send data outside of our organization? Um, if they do, that kicks off a whole different series of reviews, because it's one thing to have a device that's connected to your network that's sending data between your four walls. It's another for it to then have to send it out to like a cloud, uh, because a lot of the new technologies, that's where they're morphing towards is that cloud function. So we like to have oversight of everything that's leaving the organization. We have a council that's set up to review those requests. Um, and then we make a decision as the council, and I am just one member on that council, of whether or not the data can actually leave. So that's another kind of check and balance that mm -hmm. we put in place. Excellent. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh... I think a couple of comments here, and uh, I think that one of the things listening to, to Chris and Todd that are coming out of the, the, the conversation is that going back to our previous comments about um, diversity of devices and how different de devices behave in different ways with regard to PHI, what's sending data to where, uh, the different language, uh, so to speak, that maybe biomedical devices have and so on, uh, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, the way that I like to look at the world or the workflows when they come to, uh, to security of, of, of devices in general in healthcare is that in high level, we have a, a remediation workflow uh, with regard to vulnerabilities uh, that exists, uh, and then a risk mitigation workflow. Remediation or, or security patching in healthcare, I think, is even more challenging than perhaps other industries because of that diversity of manufacturers and different types of devices that oftentimes require um, working with the, the biomed engineers as it relates to biomed devices. Uh, sometimes they in turn need to talk to the manufacturers. Um, sometimes there's a patch, sometimes there isn't. So there's a whole process, not just technology uh, that healthcare systems need, need to go through in order to make sure that a vulnerability um, is remediated. Uh, it's not a a click of a button, like sometimes we have with, with IT, and, and that's challenging. I'm not saying that that's not challenging. That's also challenging. Uh, but in healthcare, it's, uh, I, I, sometimes I feel that the challenge is uh, compounded uh, by, uh, by this pretty rigorous process. With regard to, to risk mitigation, oftentimes what we're going to see is that a patch can't be applied. So we can't remove the vulnerability because there, there is no patch, or it's going to take time until uh, the manufacturer pushes out a um, um, a patch uh, because testing needs to be, to be put in place uh, on the manufacturer's side, assuring patient safety. And that's, of course, understandable. Um, and I think here, uh, and Todd mentioned this earlier, uh, micro segmentation or network segmentation in general is, is, is a really good practice that I'm seeing uh, and that I, I definitely agree could be, could be helpful in many cases. Going back to challenges, though, in healthcare, I think that the challenge is that you need to be able to do segmentation, but you can't tolerate any disruption to clinical workflow. So if we're putting in uh, policies about, let's say, infusion pumps, communicating to, to the internet or anything else, um, we got to make sure first and foremost, in my opinion, that we're not harming the, uh, the workflows, the clinical workflows, and then uh, at the same time also assuring uh, security. Doing that at scale, in large healthcare systems with so many diverse uh, devices, uh, that, that's going to keep your hands full uh, for sure. But but it's a it, it is a good it is a good method. So hey, I, if I can jump on the back of Jonathan's comments too, I totally agree with the challenges he's mentioned. That is absolutely true, and one that we haven't mentioned yet, which I think is worth 
um, I'm speaking up about is what I like to call the ruse of the FDA certification process. So too many of our vendors in healthcare hold us hostage. And I think Jonathan was very polite when he said, waiting for a patch, the, the real likelihood is that we're not gonna get one because it, you know when we ask for it, we'll get the whole ruse of FDA certification comment that we can't because it's FDA certified. Um, if we did that, we'd have to reassess re, um, the entire solution and we're not gonna do that. Um, the FDA did provide guidance on that, but the FDA, if you're listening, did us no favors because it's guidance. Um, make it a rule to force these providers of these medical devices that are so needed and could be like number one on the list if any of us become victim to an attack to harming a patient. So we need a rule put in place that forces them if they're gonna use off the shelf software to actually provide us patches in a quick time frame, not a reasonable time frame. that's not good enough. Some of these um, exploits that we see come out are zero day. And if I don't get a patch for 90 to 120 days, I've got a large window of exposure. So that I think is a huge challenge for healthcare in general. Chris, you agree with that? Need a rule? Yeah. Well, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the FDA has, uh, you know, has certainly left this as an open item. Uh, I understand, you know, some of that with medical device uh, technologies and and certainly patient safety is is, an, is the overarching concern. I think it just highlights why we as providers, and, and the FDA is very clear that we as providers are responsible for the safety of our own medical devices. Um, so they, they've, you know, it, it's about liabilities. Um, I, I think all the more reason why we, we need to fall back to assure that we're, you know, doing defense in depth, all the things that we've done for a long time on, on network devices, regular IT devices, we need to make sure that we're doing. So we need to have those layers. We need to assure that it's not just, uh, you know, monolithic defense that we're using. We, we need to have different solutions. Uh, we need to have different layers. We need to have different approaches to handle micro segmentation, segmentation, or whatever you'd like to, however you'd like to term it is absolutely another layer inside of what we're doing. Uh, IoT devices or IoT uh, security systems, definitely another layer. And again, it, it does start with the whole vetting and, you know, and contracting. In some cases, we've been very successful with contracting with some of our vendors that are, you know, where we hold a, uh, let's say we hold a, a pretty large piece of the market in our region. We've been very successful with negotiating with vendors medical device vendors in uh, if they don't uh, if they don't necessarily have a, a, a stance on a particular networking technology or security technology, then we get release from liability unless the specific issue that we did to the device caused the problem. So that, that allows us to apply patches in a more liberal way. It allows, allows us to apply other tool sets, normal security tool sets in a way that, you know, some vendors may not be, you know, may not be used to. So again, I think it's a lot of layers here, a lot of different approaches. And it's not just technical, it's process, it's, you know, it's people uh, and, and technologies. Yeah, you have to have that clout in order to get that through, right, Chris? I mean, not every vendor is going to jump up and down and say, hey, I'm happy to sign that. Yeah, certainly that's, uh, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why we do these types of these types of things, because you have a couple of folks on here, you know, Todd and myself come from relatively large organizations. Um, you know, we we hold a uh, you know, we hold a good good spot in the market. We mm -hmm. standardize on on our devices, which gives us a little bit more pull yeah. uh, on those on those vendor, uh, you know, on those vendors that we they, that we do do a lot of business with. Todd, have you done anything like that, uh, sort of uh, getting those vendors to adjust those contracts to, to take you off the hook a bit? Yeah. And, you know, some vendors are really good to work with. Um, others, not so much. And when the vendor has a product that they may be one of only two people that provide it, and it is considered the best, um, and we want the best for our patients, that's where you seem to run into problems. And that's where they don't really want to negotiate or provide any concessions, even to the point of you're not allowed to put AV or patches on the system because we can't guarantee the safety of the patient on the other end. So um, it creates sort of this conundrum of where they go, you should have a clean network. And we're like, you should have a clean product. 
Um, but I do think that some of the vendors are very good at listening um, and actually responding to it and agreeing to terms in the contract that um, give us a little bit of um, room there to grow. Uh, but then again, there's probably more that aren't as friendly to work with. Jonathan, what are your thoughts around all this? Uh, anything you've seen your customers doing? Any advice? I mean, God, it just comes down to the power in the marketplace, right? Who's got the power on any side of a, of a, of a buying and selling engagement? Uh, and that's flexibility comes from need, right? The flexibility comes from, I need this deal. I want this deal. And I got plenty of business and we're the best there is. So where are you going to go? Less flexibility. A hundred, I a hundred percent agree. First, just like one observation, which I think on a, on a positive note, uh, at least from, from where I'm sitting, is a, it's great to hear all this because it's an indication of, a, I think, the, the maturity of where the, the industry is going from a security standpoint. Like three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, I don't know if uh, um, a security uh, executives could have uh, this level of, uh, of negotiation with the manufacturers, and I'm hearing that more and more. So first, I think it's awesome uh, just to, to hear this today and to, and to hear this from other folks as well. Um, what I do from a Medigate perspective, uh, sometimes I feel like uh, if we're able to uh, get several of our customers to work together uh, and, then, uh, and then collaboratively approach a, a manufacturer to get a better outcome, and that may be not just for procurement purposes for them, that, that doesn't really relate to me, but more on a, what kind of information we can get, a, what kind of risk assessments we can get, because sometimes that's not all exactly publicly available. A, when we bring several together, I totally agree a, and feel like that changes the dynamic with the manufacturers. A, and a lot of them are great about it. I'll be, I think that there are a lot of a forward leaning manufacturers today that understand that the dynamic has changed uh, sometimes I'm even seeing proactive folks that are reaching out and saying, hey, we want to inform you of this so that you can push this to, to your customer base and they can be aware of that. Uh, so I think that the, the tides are, are changing a little bit, which is great. Uh, but the, the catalyst, uh, to your point, Anthony, is about the market dynamic and about uh, getting the, the community to work together to make that change because of the of the procurement value uh, that it has. So that, that's what I'm seeing. Very interesting. All right, uh, John, we're gonna stick with you on this one. Talk about how risk management can inform your connected asset security strategy. Um, I think that like, for me, from the way that I, uh, that I see uh, organizations working on this, uh, in my eyes, it all boils down to to priorities. Risk management informs priorities. If you look at, at any healthcare system, uh, definitely the larger ones, you're going to find uh, a multitude of uh, security concerns, whether it's a new vulnerability, a zero day, uh, whether it's something that, that is communicating to, to, to somewhere that it doesn't necessarily need to be. The, the list is going to be really, really, really long because that's the, that's the nature of the beast. When it comes to risk management, I think that it allows us ultimately to prioritize. And I say prioritize in my eyes in, in a healthcare environment, the way to do that is to measure the, uh, the impact of a security risk on patient safety, uh, patient privacy. Uh, it's about turning the risk into something that is adapted uh, for healthcare systems, thus informing uh, the overall priorities. Once you have these priorities, you're going to see that there are uh, that life isn't exactly easy. You're going to see that you're going to have dilemmas. For example, you may have a highly vulnerable, dangerous uh, vulnerability, high impact, but it only applies to maybe one device. You may have one that's medium to high, but it applies to thousands of devices that are uh, very much ubiquitous in your environment. So then you're going to need to apply different security controls to address to get the, the biggest uh, bang out of your buck, out of your time. So maybe for that one device, you just isolate it. Uh, but you get in, you do patching for the thousand devices or, or vice versa, but you're gonna have some dilemmas there. Ultimately though, it starts with clear priorities with regard to your risk. And I think that's what, in my eyes, why risk management 
is so important for healthcare systems. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing your own tail. Chris? Yeah, I think the other, I, I think Jonathan's right on. I, I won't try to retread his, his ground. What I will add on, though, is I think if we're smart about it, we can use risk management, uh, you know, to, to sell our program and to sell the concept of security. I, you know, I talk about it with my leadership uh, coming from a provider perspective. We're, you know, we're, we're a joint commission place. I grew up in joint commission and, and, it, and, and that is like the DNA thread that runs through many hospitals in the country. And I explain security as the same thing. I know we'll, we'll be successful when cybersecurity becomes just another DNA strand inside of healthcare, and we don't have to think about it as, what do you need to respond to that incident? What new funding do you need because of this new problem? It, it should be something that is considered part of the operations. It's part of the background of healthcare, and it just is. And we don't argue about about doing something for joint commission. We shouldn't argue about doing something for for something like cybersecurity. So that's that's the way I look at risk management. Is is how do we how do we take all the things that that Jonathan stated from a process perspective, and then turn that into the story that we need to tell our executives, and, and really have them understand what the real impacts to our primary missions. In, in my case, it's, you know, it's providing patient care, it's research and it's education. Uh, so, so that, that's where I, I, I like to see risk management used. Todd? Uh, well, I would uh, probably just piggyback on a little bit of what each um, has said up to this point, but, you know, I think the term that I like to use internally is, you know, foundational element. So um, Chris was speaking to that, and that's sort of the term I like to use is we're trying to build cybersecurity in at the foundation, and every step along the way, risk management should be something that um, is at the forefront of our minds. I think we're doing a pretty good job, at least in our organization, of considering risk, and it's really built into each of those steps. I'd referenced earlier, like our new vendor onboarding process, that's really a risk review. That's what we're doing as we look at the vendor and then we're negotiating with them on things that we think are too risky. Um, and so our staff that manage that process um, have a means to start looking at risk very early on. The other checks and balances that we've introduced, like um, if you're sending data outside the organization, that's a different risk to the organization. My team may have been looking at it from a cyber perspective. Let's go get our data governance office involved and let's look at it from a data perspective. And are we okay um, with the risk involved of, our sending, of sending our data outside the organization? Um, we also have to have you know, risk management strategies when we conduct risk analysis and connected assets should be a part of that either through your EPHI inventory or your findings. You know, as you're interviewing people for that process, you should be uncovering risks associated with connected devices. Um, and then you need to have some controls to understand, you know, I, you know, I, I take people at their word, but, you know, trust but verify is one of the old sayings. So what tools do you have to tell you if there's something in your environment? It could be a system that tells you whether or not systems are patched appropriately, vulnerability assessment tools, conducting penetration tests. These all inform you to what your risk posture looks like for your organization. And then I really think the, the, the holy grail part at the end is you have to have a place to take that to. And unless your organization has set up some sort of structure so that your um, teams that are reviewing the risk have a location to take problems to, then you're not doing yourself um, probably any favor. So we do have a council that any of those risk-based things that we're looking at can bubble up to. And yes, I will say no on something and immediately be asked, well, who can we take it to next? And so it's always good to know that I've got a council that's got my back. And I already know before I take it in that the council's not going to approve it because I work with these people every single day, right? But it's good that there's another place for it to go for others to hear someone outside of just the CISO's viewpoint on why this could be a risk to the organization. So I firmly believe in risk management principles, but they've got to be every step along the way. So the this this council, how is the level of acceptable level of risk decided, um, and is it is there a million levels for a million different areas, or or I mean, how does that work? 
Yeah, well, you know, I think that's an inexact science, to be quite honest with you. Um, as a matter of fact, in our council meeting month before last, we tried some new approaches um, to try to visually display, because these are high level folks, um, you know, that represent the business. So they're not IT people, they're, they're counterparts from all over our system. So what we're trying to do is create visuals that helps them understand where the risk is. Uh, of course, you know, traditional heat map type things help because I think people gravitate if this is yellow, then it might be okay. If it's orange or red, I need to do something with it. And if it's a shade of any color green, we're probably good. Th those are great, but we're trying to figure out what's that next step. We haven't quite gotten there yet, um, but um, we're continuing to work on maturing that. Chris, let's talk about that a little bit. The the Who's deciding what an acceptable level of risk is? If, if, if the person creating the heat map decides what they want to make red well me as as the business person would say hey i don't want anything in red right but but you're the one who put it in red so uh, they're making decisions based on uh a visual representation of someone's opinion what well, just your overall thoughts on in a health system how it, how are levels of risk decided uh for you to then work within you say okay this is you you're telling me this is too much risk okay i'll work to mitigate it but who's making the decisions? Yeah, so so we do a little bit like Todd does. We have a, uh, a multidisciplinary, multi-campus council. Uh, actually, later afternoon today is our is our bi-monthly meeting where we'll be discussing all those risk exceptions. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, we we certainly do all the prep work behind uh, you know behind the scenes, and I think I think the challenge in in IT that we have is translating all the technical nonsense that we deal with into relatable and business term type of presentations where we can just talk very, you know, uh, very down to earth on, on what the real risks of these things are. And again, I think, I think there's a place here for understanding how do we, how do we try to say yes? Because a lot of times IT and, and certainly security departments are, are seen as the, the people who say no all the time. Certainly security departments can be seen as that, you know, that healthcare cop. And we don't want to be, we don't want to be the healthcare cops, right? We, we want to be able to say yes all the time to our business whenever we can within reason. So how do we find solutions around these things that, that people are asking that may have inherent risk uh, in them? How do we mitigate that risk to an acceptable level? And then have the and then once we're comfortable with that risk, present that to the organization and say, okay, look, it's not necessarily compliant with policy. It's not necessarily compliant with all the best practices, but we understand it's a critical need in the business. And here's what we've done from a security program to mitigate the largest risks. Or if there are things that are just we can't get there with, then we have to say that as well. And and again, I will go back to Todd's piece of segmentation. Segmentation is really a critical technology that, that we're able to use very effectively to take those items that are, are just, we can't get the risk out of them and just isolate them from the rest of our network. So that if you're gonna have a failure, you're gonna have a failure on that one device or on the local connected devices that that, that, you know, that, little, that little environment, the little universe that that device needs to connect to. Um, and again, that's, that's a really key technology, but that's how we, that's how we do it. Jonathan, Always collaborate. Thank you, Chris. Jonathan, does, does segmentation in any way impact usability? It, it shouldn't, but that's the, that, that's the tricky piece. Um, ultimately, what we said earlier in this discussion is that I'll, I'll talk about the IoT devices or the biomedical devices that they have their own language. Uh, the tricky part is understanding their own language so that when you apply micro segmentation policies on the network, you're really allowing them to do what they should do, but only that. And if you had, let's say, if, uh, if we were living in, in a utopia and there was one protocol, one language, uh, one way in, in, these, in which these devices would communicate, then that would be a, a fairly a easy task to do, or, or you know, certainly not insurmountable when it's 
thousands of different devices with hundreds of different uh, protocols and different uh, types and, and shapes and sizes, uh, doing that at scale uh, without disrupting the clinical workflow, that's a, that's a challenge. And I, maybe just one thing to add, it's also a moving target. Uh, so these devices, uh, they, they change. There's new software, new updates, new firmware, new, new, new all the time, uh, or not all the time, but it is, it is happening uh, fairly frequently. Uh, so that language, so to speak, it may change over time as well. So you got to be aware of that. You say, hey, there's a new software that was installed. Now I'm seeing that the behavior has shifted slightly. Maybe I need to adapt my micro segmentation policies to make sure that nothing will change moving forward and that that lack of disruption uh, will remain so. So it's, uh, I definitely agree with, uh, with Chris and Todd. It's, uh, it's something that I would definitely advocate for. Uh, but, but there's some, of course, effort in applying and maintaining this type of technology at scale. Anthony, let me let me add on to Jonathan because that you know th those are really salient points. Um, what I what I'll what I'll just say is that using segmentation gets your IT folks to really really understand your medical devices because they have to at this point. As Jonathan pointed out, if you don't get it right, you, your device isn't going to connect. Right, it's not going to work right, and it really does. It, what I've seen is it really makes you understand. The systems that you're using and how they connect and who they have to connect to. I think that's that's really a key item here. And uh, I know that's the journey that we went through is really, we had to really understand how these things work, how they connect. And at the end of the day, it, it's all the more reason why we need the standard things like change control and testing uh, for, you know, for non- you know, non-standard IT devices like medical devices and, and other IoT systems. All right, very good. We're going to go to my favorite part. Uh, ask a co-panelist. Jonathan, you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? I do. A, I'll start with Chris. Um, you, you mentioned that you have a, a biomed a background a, and that, that you've, been, you've been on both sides of the, of the house a, throughout your career. A, and you also mentioned that you're, you, you wanted to build the biomed security a, organization in a way that mimics IT. Uh, but since there is, so my question to you is, since there is, of course, uh, differences and more importantly, perhaps uh, overlap and need, the need to collaborate between IT and, uh, and biomed, how did, you, how did you build the governance structure around that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great point. Um, you know, Jonathan, that, that I think what you're pointing out is exactly what you know, you'll find is that there, if you look at this as a, you know, as a union, right, the classical, uh, the classical mathematical union circles and where the circles intersect, that's the union set, right? So one circle being the biomed uh, skill sets, the other, the other circle being the IT skill sets. And we have to recognize that the skill sets are different. We have to reckon on both sides, IT, so the CIO needs to recognize that their skill sets are different from the CE skill sets. The CE skill sets come from wanting, you know, wanting patient safety. I mean, that's where we're grounded in on the biomed side. And on the technical side for the IT piece, usually we're not really focused on that. We're really focused on uptime. We're, we're focused on things working and connecting and, and what have you. And, and there's definitely a different, in my experience, is a different focus of the two groups. And where can you find that overlap? And that's what I mean by, you know, by having that, that's where that governance comes through, right? And CE has to play their part, IT has to play their part. For example, you know, the CE people are, for, for all the CIOs out there, the CE people are absolute experts at medical devices. They know those technologies and they probably know the workflows a lot better than anybody in IT does for the most part, right? They're, they're close to the physicians, they're close to the nurses, um, and they, they know how these medical devices interact with patients and interact with the users that IT typically never gets to see to that level. And on the other side, the CE guys have to understand that from an IT perspective, we're really methodical in IT. We have, 
we have very formalized processes for risk assessment, for change control, for upgrades and, and management. And we do that in a really methodical way. And we need to marry those, those two things. They don't have to be under the same management structure, but Jonathan, as you point out, they need to be under a governance structure that appreciates the two differences. And if they're not under that same structure, how do they work together to make sure that, look, this is just another program in, in, in the hospital, in the medical center, and the CE guys have to, have to know that there's a reason why we do security. And the IT folks have to know there's a reason why we protect our medical devices the way we do, right? And, and, and I think if we can get that understanding, we'll be in a lot better place from a governance perspective. That's how we've done it here. I, again, I've had the good fortune. Um, I run the biomed program. I run the security program. I own both of them. I own the PACS program too. So I own both of them. And, and, and it's kind of a perfect storm situation where, where I don't have to argue with anybody but myself. So, so it's a, it's a great, I had that great advantage. That's why I said I had that great advantage uh, in, in the first place. Todd, thoughts? Uh, I argue with myself all the time. So, you know, I, I, I can totally relate to that. How are things over at uh, Atrium? Um, you know, I think we are very fortunate because the majority of our organization, um, the clinical engineering and biomedical is under IT. So I'm, I can totally empathize, well, I guess I could empathize um, with those that don't have that close alignment. So a lot of the things that Chris has mentioned um, is kind of solved when they're all under one leader. So um, that certainly helps and not that every organization that could just, you know, snap their fingers and make it happen, but it certainly allows some of those standard process like change management and other things that we do so well in IT to be extrapolated out across other areas. So I do think that we are very fortunate in that regard where others may not be. Very good. Chris, do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? I, I do. Let me, just, let me just state to Todd's point, we just have to, and I'm an advocate for having, uh, I, you know, having IT run this. I asked for that, you know, 20 years ago and, and got it, got what I asked for. Um, so I'm an advocate for it. We just have to be careful as IT professionals to, and as CIOs, we need to make sure that we respect the fact that the CE folks are highly technical. They may not be highly technical in an IT sense, but if you relegate, if you relegate the CE department to just being this, this department in the basement, you'll get what you relegate them to, right? Versus having an integrated technology program, which is what we really want. Um, and that's how you'll get engagement from the biomed guys and, and gals. So I just leave that as a comment. So from a question perspective, and, and again, I'm not sure, you know, I, let's, let's throw it out and, you know, and see with, um, you know, during COVID, there were a lot of attacks on uh, IP, intellectual property. And, you know, being in a, being an academic medical center that, you know, that has research and things like that, you know, maybe over to Todd, uh, I'll say how, you know, have there been any unique tactics that you've taken that uh, mitigate some of the risks from, you know, from having research and, and having academicians and, and having this IP that by its own nature, you know, our hospitals tend to want to be locked down and our colleges tend to want to be wide open for academic freedoms and, and collaboration across the, the globe. So they're, they're kind of competing. What kind of tactics have you used to kind of mitigate those risks? Yeah, you know, that, that is honestly kind of a, a, a struggle because anytime you're dealing with education, you get the educational mindset, right? And it's like education is supposed to be open. Um, yeah, but the healthcare side of the business is not necessarily that open and we're constrained by federal law. So we can't just have everything open, right? So what we try to do is continue to provide some education throughout COVID. Um, it has created some unique circumstances, you know, picking up you know, a huge chunk of at least the business side office folks for our enterprise and sending them home created its own challenges. And then we knew that even though the threat actors said, hey, we're gonna take a break for a little while, that was what, maybe a week or two. Um, and then they picked back up with their same old, um, you know, same old game. And so what we try to do is like fishing is, a, you know, a big deal and it's regardless of whether or not it's on, you know, the education and research side or any part of your business, um, whether it's IP or your data, because your data is very well, well maybe your most valuable asset, 
they're trying to get at that. And so what we did was we took active threats, we'd intercept and block that our teammates never got, repurposed them, put them in our training tool and sent them right back out to our teammates to continue to test them. Um, we've also decided we will continue to look for new opportunities to improve and, and evolve, which I think all of our programs are likely doing that from a maturity standpoint, uh, because the threat looks different when you move your workforce somewhere else. So we've created some tracking sheets to identify gaps there um, and then close them as quickly as possible. So it's really a collection of things that we've done more so than any one thing. Jonathan, anything you want to add on that? Uh, I'm, I mean, the only thing I think that it's it's a it's a variety of tactics that at least I'm I'm hearing from um, uh, from our customers and from the partners in the industry in general. Uh, the one thing that I will say, and uh, probably this isn't new to to anyone on the call, is that the the threat to, to healthcare throughout COVID and kind of those targeted attacks that a lot of folks have been speaking around um, uh, phishing attempts and whatnot. Uh, it's it's definitely happening uh, across the board, uh, as as unfortunate and malicious as it may sound. But hearing a lot of uh, a lot of bad stories around that, and a lot of the, definitely an uptick in terms of those types of attacks, unfortunately. All right, Todd, you have a question for your co-panelists. We have a couple minutes left. Um, I will make it quick. So this is directed to Chris, and it's pretty simple. How do you make sure you have a seat at the table? Uh, when new solutions are presented, whether they're connected assets, new applications, or um, whatever it may be within your environment? Yeah, I, again, I think uh, we had the benefit of having, um, you know, having responsibility for at least a, a major portion of the devices, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm talking about the biomedical devices. So we, we had that built-in seat at the table there from uh, you know, from that perspective, but it, it comes down to assuring that the organization has a formalized process for budgeting and for acquisition and that there's, you know, that that review is built in, uh, you know, to that budgeting process. If, if it's not, that's where you get this. The, you're not going to eliminate 100% of the surprises, right? I mean, you're always going to have you know, maybe you have a doc that, uh, you know, a high-end doc that you're bringing in as a specialty and they were promised something, you know, to come in and, and that's going to be a surprise. That That's always going to happen. But, you know, you make those the exceptions and uh, you set up a formalized process. It's about governance. It's about, you know, budgeting. It's about, uh, you know, acquisition process. And, and that's what, and that's what we do. And we're at the table from that, even from the point of including things like, um, you know, TCO and, and uh, in the TCO model, uh, you know, putting in your, uh, your RPOs and your RTOs for business continuity and disaster recovery. And then that drives other, you know, other dollars into a budget. So it, it has to be a TCO model where you're, you're looking at everything and you can't do that without pulling in, uh, you know, IT number one. And then as a subset of that, uh, the cyber program to really evaluate what, you know, what those pieces and parts are that are going to cause dollars up front or down the road for your organization. All right, we're almost out of time. Jonathan, I just want to give you an opportunity for a final thought, piece of advice, parting word. Um, I think we said a lot today. A lot. We went into the kind of the the, the technology and the the, the actual uh, tech that needs to be applied. Uh, but one thing that we that's just important for me to to stipulate is that the if I were to start a, a program, a security program, first thing that should be addressed is is people and process. No no point in going to the tech whether it's a segmentation or, or any other one of the things that we talked about today without getting a good transparent process uh, between the different stakeholders. Otherwise, the, the tech, as good as it may be, it's just not going not gonna to be successful. So that, that would be one point of advice maybe to end with. Very good. That's about all we had time for today regarding continuing education. You could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready for viewing. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and you can go to our website to register for upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel, Todd Green, Chris Couchet, and Jonathan Langer. And I want to thank Medigate for sponsoring and making the event possible and our attendees for joining once again. With that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.